listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life inspired by the ancient tradition of Stoic philosophy from Greece and Rome. I'm your host, Justin Vakula. Find my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com. This is episode 111, Stoic Philosophy for Teenagers and Everyone Else, with Tanner Campbell. Tanner Campbell is an American philosopher of Stoicism and host of the most reviewed Stoicism podcast on Spotify, Practical Stoicism, where he publishes daily episodes on Stoic texts, concepts, and theory. He is also a regular contributor to Stoic Gym magazine, and has co-authored the upcoming book Stoicism But Brief, with Kai Whiting, co-author of Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living in. Tanner lives in Denver, Colorado, with his partner and their two dogs, Jupiter and Winston. Enjoy the show. All right. Thank you for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Love the chance to speak to to other Stoics and whoever's listening to them and interested in Stoicism. Can you give a quick introduction to Stoicism for listeners who may not be as familiar with Stoicism or Stoic philosophy? Sure. I think a lot of people think of it as being a philosophy of resilience and emotionlessness. And and those things are, the resilience is partially true emotionlessness, not so much. At its core, Stoicism is a virtue ethics-based philosophy, and the entire goal of it uh, is to live in accordance with nature and to develop a virtuous character. So it is a character exploration and improvement philosophy that you try to become a better person through. Yes, and by virtue and character, what do the Stoics talk about there? Sure. So uh, virtue is what the Stoics refer to as the only good. So if you're an Aristotelian, for example, you might say that uh, virtue is the highest good. And if you're something other than an Aristotelian, but not a Stoic, you might say that virtue is a good. Uh, But the Stoics set themselves apart in classical uh, ancient Greek philosophies by saying that virtue is the only good. Uh, And so virtue is the development of uh, it's the development of character, and it's the mastery of the sage is the only person in um, in Stoicism that is truly virtuous. Everyone else is what's referred to as a prokopton. Uh, they're working on developing their character, so they're they're moving closer towards virtue. Uh, but it means a sort of mastery or a sort of complete knowledge of what are referred to as cardinal virtues and subordinate virtues. Subordinate virtues are you can think of them like mini virtues, like uh, kindness and charitableness and things like that. But the cardinal virtues are wisdom, bravery, justice, and temperance. Or if you prefer, you can think of temperance as kind of like self-control or, or moderation is a, is a more contemporary word that mm-hmm. people understand. All right, good. And the Stoics are seeing things through a rational lens, challenging the thoughts that we have and wondering if they are as they really are, not just, oh, well, we feel a certain way. Let's just run with a certain negative or overly positive emotion where called to be self-reflective. Yeah, incredibly important in Stoicism. We, we talk about something called ascent and impressions. We want to make sure, generally speaking, that our view of the world is, as you've said, an accurate interpretation of the world. And we're all fairly bad at this, <laughs> right? People will act a certain way and will make assumptions about why they're acting that way. And of course, that can snowball pretty quickly. And all of a sudden, you have this view of a person that you've formed as this sort of incomplete, complete view uh, based on uh, almost no input. And so the Stoics would ask us to very carefully examine using our hegemonicon or our rational faculties, the facts that we know. And until we have enough information to assent to an opinion that we feel is a true reflection of reality, we're supposed to uh, stand off or or hold off on assenting, A-S-S-E-N-T, assenting, not ascending. And we'll talk today about teenagers and stoicism. So maybe some examples of inaccurate judgments that we might have. For instance, if a teenager's parent might say, okay, well, you have to be home at eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Some people might think, oh, well, my parents don't trust me or, oh, my parents don't like me or, oh, they're being too strict. These could be some inaccurate judgments that we might hold. Uh, absolutely. They could also be accurate. <laughs> and, maybe, and, and maybe you've earned that mistrust. That's also possible. Uh, but, but yes, uh, I think, you know, remembering what I was like as a teenager, oh, dad doesn't understand when, you know, m- more often than not, it was that dad understood just fine. <laughs> and he was also concerned for my safety, not trying to be a bummer or a drag, as my dad would say. All right. So hopefully some reasonable boundaries, hopefully some element of trust, hopefully 
All right, and to move on to a different topic here, why might teens be interested in stoicism? A lot of what I've been seeing online and my content personally has been adult facing, as most of my audience are adults, but now with the internet and electronics and smartphones and much more, more teens are getting into philosophy. So what can teens find from stoicism? I think that a lot of online culture on the younger end of the spectrum, and let's just say younger than me, I'm 39, so let's say younger than 30, let's say. I think a lot of it is, it seems to be pretty disenchanted. It seems to be interested in things like dank memes and doing things just for the lulls is a, is a phrase that maybe is a little bit too old <laughs> for the younger people who might be listening. But it seems very, you know, there's no point to life. It's very nihilistic. I, I'm pretty concerned with that. And, and I think if you're a young person, you're probably concerned with it. It doesn't seem like there is a point to living. You know, eventually I'm going to die anyway. So what does it matter? Anything I do? I find that to be a very common opinion among younger people, specifically you know, 17 to 20 in there, they're really struggling. But even after that, we have a whole age range of people who listen to our podcast uh, from 17 to you know, 65 or 70, I think are the oldest people in our communities. Wow. Uh, and it, it can feel pretty hopeless. And I think one of the reasons that religion was so successful for so long is because it gave people a framework by which to live. And you can absolutely debate how healthy a framework that was. That's not for me to do. Um, but it was a framework, and it did give direction. It did give direction, which is useful when you are young and are not sure what to do next. Which is, I mean, I don't know about you, Justin, but when I was young, I, I wasn't sure what to do next. And the thing that uh, helped me wasn't stoicism because I didn't know about it at the time. We didn't really have. I don't want to make myself sound sound like a cave dwelling caveman or anything, but we didn't really have the internet as it is today. Uh, when I was, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, it was, it was very nascent, I guess, in let's say social media and, and uh, communications. But the only thing that really pulled me out of not knowing what to do and frankly being a bit scared and I, I flunked out of high school as a result or flunked out of ninth grade anyway, uh, and then eventually got my GED, the only thing that put me on the right path was military academy, in fact, because it offered a structure and gave me no choice but to follow that structure. Now, I'm not suggesting that that works best for everybody. Uh, it worked really well for me as someone with ADHD. And I think structure is important for young people who, f who feel kind of directionless. And I think stoicism can offer that in a way that's, let's say, less aggressive than military academy might be, less of an extreme option. Uh, and I think I think young people probably would have a, a lot to a lot of good information to glean and a lot of direction to gain uh, if they if they gave stoicism a look, I think that's one of the biggest benefits of it. Gives you something to, gives you a framework to underpin your life. Yes, I think acceptance is a major theme within stoicism that can help a lot of young and old people alike accepting things that are outside of our control, but also changing what we can change. Yeah, referred to as, uh, and I'm sure you've discussed it on the podcast before, uh, refer referring to the dichotomy of control. It's not really the best mm -hmm. interpretation of what... Um, Epictetus was getting at. It's more like things that we do and don't have the ability to decide or determine, uh, control, power, uh, th those kind of words are not really used by Epictetus. It's kind of how we translate it in a contemporary sense, but there are decisions we can make, choices we can make, and choices that we can't make, and decisions that we can't make, outcomes that we can guarantee, and outcomes that we can't. Uh, and it is rather soothing, especially if you're somebody with anxiety to, to know that there and to accept that there are things which we have the ability to choose the outcome of and things we don't and that's okay in fact it, it's a built-in fact of life that can be very comforting to a young person or quite frankly anyone who's uh, struggling with feeling like they have to have the right things happen all the time I and mean, they have to be the agents that you know, determine those right things or make those right choices or have the, have those outcomes be what, you know, I have to get straight A's in school. Well, I mean, you have some control over whether or not you can do well in school, but you also have a fair amount of things in, uh, in, in life that could cause you to not do so well in school that you have no control over. Your house could get blown away by a tornado. You could uh, not be able to get back into school for a year and now you're behind and you didn't have the control over that. Uh, and so recognizing some of what you are able to decide and some of what you're able not to decide 
is helpful. It, it can it can calm the nerves a bit and let you feel like it's okay that I'm not in complete control of everything, and and that's normal. Yes, not being too hard on yourself about those things that are outside of your control, or hopefully not being hard on yourself at all, just trying to focus on what's in your domain and what you can influence. When I used to work with elementary school students, I would often play games with them, and there would be elements of chance, elements of skill, and they would learn lessons. Look, if you take your time, you think about it, you make the right decisions, well, things won't always go your way. And for older people too, things don't always go our way, but we can still make an effort to make right decisions and not be so results oriented where stoicism calls us to be more process. -oriented. Right. And if it makes anyone listening feel better, it is becoming an adult doesn't fix anything. <laughs> still plenty <laughs> of things that we don't have any say over for sure. Yeah. Not, not everything will go our way, but one thing I think that helps for teens is identifying what you're good at, what you like. Maybe there can be an overlap of that where if you like something like music, you can spend some time on learning an instrument a certain skill, whatever it is. And that could be something that works for you where maybe you're not so coordinated, you're not as good with sports. Okay, well, maybe I can play drums or guitar and I've tried sports before, don't really like it, maybe it's not good for me. So maybe an example there can be helpful to some listeners. And, and I think in making those decisions, uh, it might be important to mention role ethics. You know, stoicism has role ethics as a strong part of it. And that's the idea that we are given certain roles by uh, our governments, our societies, our employers, ourselves, um, through our decisions or through our personal preferences. So for example, you might decide to adopt a dog and now you've taken on the role of dog owner, or you might like SpongeBob SquarePants be a fry cook. And <laughs> so now you've taken on the responsibility of fry cook. Uh, and so it's always important from a stoic perspective to remember that the things that you elect to take on uh, that you approach them with some amount of seriousness, not, you know, not sternness, not boringness, not feeling like it's, uh, you know, you've been enslaved in this choice that you've made now and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, but it is important in stoicism to give careful thought to the things you just you electively take on as roles. And it's also as you get older, and this is something that all young people, I think, w will struggle with through. Uh, just just through the maturity process, being filling filling the roles that authority assigns you. For example, in society, we're part of a cosmopolis in the a world city in the Stoic view. Uh, so one of our responsibilities, one of our roles that that we as Stoics are called to live up to, uh, is a responsibility to the cosmopolis. If we see trash on the street, we should pick it up. Uh, if there's a particular issue that is um, causing an illness to, and I don't mean a literal illness, but is ailing, let's say, our local community. Um, there's a homelessness problem or there's a drug addiction problem, things like that. Those are things that we as Stoics are called by role ethics uh, relative to the cosmopolis, which are assigned to us as citizens, that we have to address those things. We have to care about those things and we have to think about them and decide what to do about them. Uh, and with our jobs as well, when we take on positions as my first job, I was a dishwasher at an Italian restaurant in Lake Worth, Florida. It was probably the worst job I ever had, um, at least the <laughs> least entertaining and fun job I ever had. Uh, and I'll admit I wasn't very stoic about it at the, at the time. But if if you're a young person with a job that you don't really like, well, first know that you probably have the, the ability to change that job. You're not married to it. You don't have to stay there. But so long as you stay there, you do have a responsibility to it as, as someone with a role uh, of an employee in that case. So all those things are worth considering. Right. So giving good effort, taking responsibility that's worthwhile. Of course, we're going to choose what we're getting into. We're not just going to take on every little thing and pick every battle. We're going to have to make choices about that. Maybe for teens in school, maybe if you're involved in some group work or some team or sport or club that you're going to make a good effort to contribute to that rather than trying to drag everybody else down or making others do more work for us. It's putting in a good amount of effort and having some sense of fairness with responsibility as well. A hundred percent. And what you said about not taking on everything, I think we can feel over. I mean, I try to, I cannot, I cannot even imagine being a teenager today. Um, I was a teenager, you know, tw I don't know, I do the math <laughs> a long time ago, <laughs> decades ago. <laughs> America yeah, loves yeah. math. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't even imagine being a student today or being a teenager today because there's so I see like the, the issues of bullying and the ways people can be bullied. Like when I was in school, 
the way you could be bullied was like one pretty much one way <laughs> physically that was and, and when you left school the bullying was over uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore as a teenager today and that's a bummer um, so I, I know that there are a lot of stresses inside of uh, high school or middle school or teen, teenage environment now that I couldn't possibly understand as somebody who isn't part of it anymore but I do know that one thing that can have changed is that we as teenagers feel and f myself felt compelled to just, you know, do all the things and not in a fun sense, like I want to try everything, that's fine. But in an, I'm obligated to join an intramural basketball team. I'm obligated to join the chess club. I'm obligated to, you know, I have to hang out with my friends. I, I have to do this thing. Part of it, peer pressure, part of it, just a desire to want to be cool or to fit in. Really careful to think about those things. Like, is this actually going to make my life better? Is this going to improve my character? Uh, or is this going to be something that I'm only doing because I want somebody else to be happy? You can't make other people happy. That's that's on them. And you really got to consider that stuff before you, you overcommit yourself, as Justin has said. Another theme that I see in Stoicism, it's not events that upset us, but our judgments about them. So this is something that you'll also see in Buddhism. There's this great Buddhist uh, quote. I can't remember who said it, of course. Uh, but it's something like, hey, if you have a flat tire, uh, it's not that the car has a problem, right? It's that you have a problem with the 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 situation you find yourself in, right? You're late to work and you view that as problematic. So, so stoicism would have us say, we usually assent to an opinion that a situation is bad because we view it as an inconvenience. So a flat tire is a perfect example. You're driving your car, uh, you're under the gun to get to work, you get a flat tire, you got to pull over, you're going to be 20 minutes late, your boss is texting you, calling you, yelling at you, telling you you're going to lose your job. And we get upset because we have opinions in that example of, I'm going to lose my job, I'm not going to be okay, uh, my boss is going to get mad at me, my mom and my dad is going to get mad at me for losing my job. And so it's not really this, the it's not really the being late that we're upset about. It's not really the flat tire that we're upset about. It's these consequences that we're upset about. And so something that you will uh, spend a lot of time trying to suss out in in a stoic practice is, do I really need to be upset about this? And if it's not within my ability to choose, I can't choose that I got a flat tire. That just happened. That was out of my control. I can't be on time to my job if I have a flat tire. And that's not, you know, those are my rules. That's <laughs> rules of speed and travel. Like I, I, I have to do this to get there and this is going to take time. And if my boss is going to get mad at me, and you're going to fire me, and my mother's going to be upset with me. Well, those are very unreasonable things. And I can't stop other people from being unreasonable. I can only do what I think is the appropriate, that's another word that's used a lot in Stoicism, the appropriate thing to do in this sense, and that is to make an attempt to somehow change my flat tire, call AAA, update the people who are involved in this situation tangentially, right? My boss is involved, so I should call them and I should say, I have a flat tire, I'm gonna be late to work, I've got AAA on the way, I'll get there as soon as I can. You can do that, and you should, because communication is important. You should maybe call your parents to let them know you're on the side of the road. <laughs> My car's broken down, I'm on Interstate 95, uh, and I've got AAA coming, I just wanna let you know I'm okay, uh, and the car will be fixed, and you know I might get in trouble at my work because of this, but I've already called them and spoken to them and let them know I would be late. And You can only do the things that seem appropriate to you and are reflective of someone with a good character. Uh, you want you want to do things that are reflective of having a good character. That's how you want to act. And if you've done those things, well, I mean, what else can you do? And if you can't control it, why would you be upset about it? Right. It's a good shift of mindset. And within Stoicism, authors are talking about reframing obstacles as opportunities as, oh, well, this is a challenge. This could be an opportunity for me to overcome that and show my character maybe learn something from this situation, maybe trying to test myself in certain ways, like, oh, well, I had a difficult time with a homework assignment or a test, so maybe this can be something for me to study more, to improve, to ask for help. There can be all sorts of different paths that we take rather than just being angry or saying things like, oh, well, that teacher is just dumb, or, oh, this was impossible. Or, oh, it's my mom's fault because I didn't get much sleep last night and just making excuses. It's taking responsibility and looking for ways to solve the problem. Yeah, and it's something that I wish that I was just remarking on this with uh, my co-host Kai Whiting, that I wish I had 
figured out sooner that the important thing in life, and, you know, I can say this till I'm blue in the face, and it's probably true that most young people won't listen in the same way that I didn't, and maybe you didn't, Justin, when... Oh, no! <laughs> right, right. Um, is It's really you. It's the character you're building that is the most important thing to be focusing on. It's not how cool you are, how much money you are, how, how much money you have, how much men or women like you, how many friends you have, how popular you are the car you drive that is it's so incredibly unimportant and it's something that you know you're not going to get until it smacks you in the face which is what happened to me uh and if i could if i could beg anyone on this show to to just to get to a realization as fast as possible it's that the, the number one thing in life you should be spending your time doing is just developing a good version of yourself a virtuous character that it's it's so important and when that becomes your focus man, everything changes. Like the things that used to stress you out are like, well, if my goal is to develop a healthy, good, virtuous character, if, if that is what my goal is, I guess I don't really care if I go to that party tomorrow, or I don't care if I am viewed as uncool for sneaking out of my house to go get drunk with my friends before I'm old enough to drink. Because as you explore that process, you're like, well, would a person of good character sneak out of their parents' home? Uh, would they put themselves at risk? Would they do things that are socially deemed as being illegal things to do? Would they put their health at risk? I guess they wouldn't do those things. So, so maybe I don't need to go to that party, and, and maybe, maybe, I'll be, maybe I'll be able to develop my character a bit faster if I put my character at the forefront of my decisions as opposed to, again, popularity, material possession, things like that. Yes, the Stoic author Seneca often talks about not compromising our character, giving into the crowds, and notes that the, the crowds, the mobs, the people, the public, they could be wrong about many important issues. Just because so many people assent to an opinion doesn't make the opinion correct. Sometimes the unpopular thing, the unpopular stance is, oh, well, everybody else is doing it. It doesn't mean it's right. It's, it's just about making the good decision regardless of what other people are doing. And it's also true that Seneca also said, along with that, it may have even been in the same uh, moral letter, which is, I think, where you're getting that. Uh, Seneca also said, no man should be left alone because the unvirtuous man, uh, which is all of us, right? We're all unvirtuous because we're not sages. We're not there yet. We're still working on it. That the unvirtuous man is a, is a bad man, speaking in the stoic sense of good and bad, virtuous and vicious. Uh, and that if you leave a non-sage alone, they'll ruminate and they'll they'll create further evils for themselves by ruminating on, oh, they thought that, and I guess I should have done this, and and they'll get down the rabbit hole. So so Seneca does say you shouldn't listen to the mob, to the crowds, because what's popular is not necessarily what's right, and there are plenty of other authors throughout history who who have touched on that through probably every century that there has been so far uh, since writing existed. He also says that not being alone and having mentorship, uh, probably a show like this, in fact, Justin, having someone who can check your thoughts uh, and help you figure out whether or not they're vicious thoughts or virtuous thoughts, good or bad thoughts, that that's helpful. So you shouldn't be alone and you should have some mentorship and someone who knows more and someone who can help you and someone who can be a sounding board who you can bounce ideas off of, someone whom you trust. But that's also important. Avoid crowds, but don't be alone, which is another a misunderstanding of Stoicism is that it's a lone wolf philosophy. And certainly Stoicism would try to develop the sort of person and character who could be alone, who could live alone in the woods and be unbothered by that. But Stoicism is more so about participating in society and and filling your roles, as, as we talked about before, uh, and helping the cosmopolis and building that character. And you could be alone in the woods, but stoicism doesn't necessarily tell you to do that. That That's more of a, a, a cynic would be, a capital C cynic would be more along those lines. Uh, still places virtuous, if I'm not mistaken, the only good, but uh, doesn't see a responsibility to the cosmopolis and instead focuses solely on virtue. And so it can be more uh, more hermetic might be the wrong term, but can be more like a hermit. <laughs> yeah, and Seneca wrote a lot about the importance of friendship as his moral letters you mentioned are written to his friend Lucilius. 
and was giving him advice, was saying, okay, be open with your thoughts and you should be able to ask questions to those you trust and be vulnerable and that this should benefit everyone, not only you, but also the friend as you can be working in tandem towards different goals. You could be working together towards certain goals. Seneca was also saying, surround yourself with the best and be very careful about the people that you spend time with. And I think that's something for teenagers that, oh, just because you have a neighbor or you've known this person for several years doesn't mean that you should necessarily be continuing deep associations with those people, especially if those people might happen to be making poor decisions, if they're mean to you, if they're mean to others. What what might be some of the traits that we should look for in friends? Well, I think probably the traits that you're looking to develop in yourself, you should be looking for trustworthy individuals and you should probably observe them from a distance to determine whether or not they are those things. Uh, honest people, trustworthy people, uh, people who are also perhaps focused on their character. Although I realize the younger you are and the Stoics said that, you know, really you don't teach Stoicism or philosophy to a young person until they're around you know, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there, there is such a thing as teaching philosophy at such a young age that it becomes indoctrination rather than advice, rather than a helpful framework, it becomes trying to get someone to be what you want them to be instead of trusting that they have the rational faculties necessary to figure it out on their own. Uh, and we see that in religions as well, people indoctrinating people at a very young age instead of letting them come to quote unquote mature uh, faculty maturity, mental f maturity before uh, introducing those concepts, um, but but you want to see people who are doing the things that you want to be doing, and that's tricky because if you're not character forward or character first, then what you might want to do is hang around with attractive boys or attractive girls, and you see some friends who are really good at that for some reason, and they're always at parties, and they're cool, uh, and if those are the things you want to be, then you know you're definitely going to go down a less virtuous, more vicious path uh, if if those are the things you're you're trying to look for in your friends. But if you're character forward, and character first, then you're going to be looking for people who are honest. You're going to be looking for people who take their responsibilities in society resp uh, uh, seriously, regardless of what those are. Again, fry cook, citizen, trash picker, upper, you know, uh, son, daughter, dog owner, cat owner, whatever. Uh, and you're going to want to try to hang out with those people. And when you're a teenager, those people aren't like, let's be honest, Justin, those aren't the cool kids, right? Like those aren't the, <laughs> those aren't the kids that people are like, oh, I really want to be them. You know, they're the kids who might be on the honor roll or they're the kids who might be more quiet and reserved and don't have a hundred friends and maybe sit alone at lunch. But, you know, you find out when you get older that you almost wish sometimes that you were those kids. <laughs> you wish you had taken your schoolwork a little bit more seriously. You wish you'd had better friends. Because after high school, man, everybody kind of disappears and goes their own way. Those people are not usually permanent in your life. And so to have your, um, to have too much of your young life revolve around what other people think of you, they're going to be gone in, you know, a few years. And you're going to wonder why you ever, why you ever cared what, what they thought of you instead of thinking, you know, caring about what you thought of yourself. Yeah, it's been a while since I was in high school. I hardly speak with anyone from high school. One thing about being an adult is just a much larger network of people that I meet and associate with. So it's definitely one benefit of being an adult is that you're not just stuck in this high school. It might seem like, oh, this is everything because I'm here every day, five days a week, whatever it happens to be. It's a small community. You don't drive in many cases. So uh, until you're older anyway, maybe it could seem like things aren't going to change, but in the future, they almost certainly do. So maybe these temporary things of, oh, this particular day didn't go as I planned, or this person was mean to me, maybe it's not as bad as we really think it is, given that time can pass us by pretty quickly. That's another message within Stoicism. Life can pass us by, so let's try to uh, make the most of it while we still can. Yeah, memento mori, it's probably the most, although it's a Latin phrase, and of course, Stoicism started as an, as an ancient Greek philosophy, then transitioned into Rome. Uh, so Momentum Mori is Latin, but it still, you know, carries it, it. Remember, you must die. Remember, you're going to die. Remember your death. Uh, and use that to, a lot of people use that as a way of, you know, not being afraid, which is useful, or, you know, remembering that this, this too shall pass. And that's also useful. 
Uh, but the way that people used to use it, it used to be really common in the 1900s uh, and 1800s especially to see skulls on their desks. And, and in most cases at that point, <laughs> real skulls uh, to, and it would say memento mori on it. And the the reason for that wasn't an, obsess, an obsession with the morbid, um, but it, rather it was to, while they were working at their desk, to look at that occasionally and think, I don't have that much more time left potentially to do this work. So it, it's kind of like a way of refocusing yourself on, in those, in those cases, in the cases I'm, I'm outlining here, work, like at your job or your career or your big ambitions. A Stoic, a traditional Stoic would ask you to use memento mori would not necessarily be to remind yourself to do your work, but to remind yourself that you only have so much time left before you don't have any time left to develop your character. So it's to draw your attention back to the moment and say, I might not have a lot of moments left. The most important good in Stoicism is virtue, and I should be developing a virtuous character. And am I using my time wisely? It's a reminder to draw your focus back to the development of your virtuous character. Uh, and it's useful in that way. A lot of people get tattoos. I have plenty of tattoos, although as is the case with most people with tattoos, when they get older, they're like, I mean, I don't know, I could take them or leave them. <laughs> you know, they're not bad, but I probably wouldn't get another one. I'm 40 and I can't imagine I get another tattoo. But um, some, some young people get tattoos of a memento mori or they get a coin that says memento mori on the front or on the back and has a skull. And sometimes I tie a string around my finger to to remember things like that. Um, and, you know, it's good to have a visual aid. It's helpful. Memento mori ultimately is just a reminder to not drift from the moment and worry too much about the future or fear, or regret too much about the past. Hey, you're running out of time. Let's get this character built. We hear the word happiness thrown about a lot. And I think most people think of happiness as, oh, I'm eating this tub of ice cream or, oh, I had so much fun today. Within stoicism, I think the authors are mostly thinking of happiness in terms of contentment in being free from excessive negative emotions, feeling a sense of accomplishment, developing our character and having a sense of stoic joy that, okay, we can have some fun. We can look to leisure, but not overdo it. We can have sense of moderation, balance, and find fulfillment in many different ways. So for you, what do you, what do you think about as happiness is concerned or finding meaning or purpose in life? You know, it's funny. I wrote an article a long time ago well, I'm saying a long time ago, I guess it was 2014-ish, 2015 maybe, for modern Stoicism. And I completely forgot that I had done that until I got back into Stoicism just a year ago now. Uh, and it was about happiness. It was about this very point that you're making, that the question, are you happy, is almost a malformed question, because it's not really the answer. It's not really the question that you want to ask to elicit the response. Happiness is, as you said, it's this temporary experience of elation. You, you get something you want. Uh, somebody, you know, you open a present, it's Christmas, uh, you, you get the Red Rider BB gun. Maybe not everybody will get that reference, but uh, you get your Red Rider BB gun and you're happy. Uh, but that's just temporary. Just this temporary form of elation when you get the things you want or, or you get a nice surprise. When we talk about eudaimonia, a flourishing life, an excellent life is probably a better interpretation of, of that, living an excellent life, having an, a virtuous character. We are thinking about something more like contentment. And, and that comes through, I honestly feel that the only way that you arrive at contentment is a focus on developing your character. Because if, if your contentment in life relies upon a bunch of factors you can't control, then the obvious logical outcome of that is that contentment is not possible because if you know if if your requirement for contentment is that so and so be president and so and so other person not be president if you need that to be content in your life you will only be content you know presumably half the time when the person you want to be in office is actually in office uh, or when the outcome of the football game is the outcome you want it to be uh, and that is not a great, that's not a, a great necessity to, or rather that's not a great need to anchor yourself to um, as far as, as far as your contentment's concerned. When you start looking at your character, which I've now said, I think a couple times now, when you start looking at your character and you say, this is the thing that matters most over time, as you get better uh, at being a quote unquote good person 
working towards virtue and working uh, down the, the path of the Prakatan and towards the position of sage, well, when you get there, as you work your way down that path, you will begin to find your contentment building in more and more significantly sized blocks. You'll start by saying, what matters is my character. And then after 10 years, you're pretty, you're decently happy with or content with the effort that you've put in for the last 10 years. And you're like, you know, I, I'm glad that I go to the gym and I take care of my body. Uh, and I'm glad that I eat well. And I'm glad that I take my friendship seriously. And, and I'm, I'm glad that I talk to my parents on a regular basis and fill the role of son or daughter well. And then you do that for another 10 years. And your contentment just grows the more competent you become at, at doing those sorts of things, filling those roles and developing your character around the idea of what is appropriate. Again, I said we say that a lot in Stoicism, but uh, appropriate action and thinking. And those blocks just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you become more and more and more content. Whereas if you're trying to base your contentment off external factors, it doesn't mean external factors don't matter or we shouldn't care about them. The Stoics don't say that. But if, if you've tied, or as I said before, anchored your contentment to externals, then you're not in control of your own contentment. The rest of the world is. And how will you ever be content in that situation? It's not possible. Yeah, some people seeking too much pleasure, coming in with high expectations. For instance, people that decide it's a good idea for whatever reason to spend something like $150, $200 for a meal when they have an option to spend maybe about $10 for something that's healthy, something that's filling. And I hear these people that they yearn for the steakhouse. Oh, it's this great thing. And then afterwards, someone asks them, well, how was it? Oh, well, the service was slow. Oh, the food wasn't cooked so well. Oh, the portion size was small. So they come up with these high expectations. It doesn't meet the expectation, whereas the people living in a more modest way seem to be okay with that kind of lifestyle rather than searching, searching for more. Sometimes people really never satisfied. And this comes up a lot in Stoic texts. Uh, Epictetus has this idea that under a thatched roof uh, lies slavery, that the person who's looking to spend so much money and have all these fine things that in some cases they really lack their own personal agency, that they've given away something of their own character in pursuit of material things. The Stoics often calling for some sort of moderation. Okay, well, don't just live in the woods, as you were saying earlier, or have no possessions whatsoever, but rather to embrace the modest life rather than going for too much or too little. So in Stoicism, we use the term indifference a lot. That sounds like it ends in E-N-C-E, -E, as in I feel indifferently towards someone. I don't care about them. They're not important. Uh, but, it, but it actually ends in E-N-T-S. So it's the plural of indifferent. An indifferent is something that does not have an impact on our ability to build a virtuous character. So the Stoics are pretty extreme about this. Uh, world peace is an indifferent. Slavery is an indifferent, but only in Stoic terms, right? I told you just because something was not uh, virtue didn't mean it didn't matter. It just mean it meant it wasn't good because the Stoics defined good as being only virtue. So sometimes slavery might be a good thing. Sometimes um, world peace, or let's say uh, a wealthy life might be a bad thing. So as an example, if you're very wealthy, that could come with all kinds of negative things, right? You could become addicted to gambling. You could become addicted to uh, possessions of things. You could become addicted to drugs. You could have a really poor character. And since in Stoicism, that's the only good, then the Stoics would say that wealth in that case was not a preferred indifferent, but it was a dispreferred indifferent in, in that it had the potential to negatively impact our character because it might make it easy for us to allow that to happen, right? We're choosing to allow that, in that case, wealth to corrupt us rather than help us. But because the wealth on, it own, on its own can't make you virtuous or vicious, um, it's still an indifferent, although most people look at it as a, as a preferred indifferent because most people think they can use wealth to their advantage to build better characters, although that's not always true. And the opposite example was slavery. Uh, obviously, how, how could anybody ever think that slavery would be anything but a dispreferred indifferent if it was an indifferent at all? Uh, and the Stoics would say, well, you know, what if a father, uh, you know, let's create a fictitious country, but a very poor country, a father has a child and they're barely making it. They have barely enough money to feed themselves. It's 
very impoverished and the father gets an opportunity to, I don't know, move away to, uh, let's say, Finland or something to get a job. And, and all of a sudden he'll become, he'll have much more money and he'll be able to take care, be able to buy a home uh, and he'll be able to provide better for his son and his family. But he has to make that trip by himself. And he can't leave his kid alone because his wife has passed away. And so he calls up a friend and he says, can you watch my child for me while I'm away? It's the biggest opportunity our family's ever had. And his friend says, well, I mean, I could house him, but I can't feed him unless he works for me. So he's going to have to, he's going to have to work for me, which is kind of like an indentured servitude, right? And, 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 and in that case, in that very particular situation, that sort of servitude or slavery would be preferred over their continued existence in poverty by the father turning down the, the opportunity to go uh, make a little bit more money and improve the quality of their life. So the Stoics are very, ex and I've, I've chosen those two extremes for obvious reasons, because they're extremes. But the Stoics would ask us to treat everything that isn't virtue or vice as an indifferent. Uh, and that's everything between those two ends of that extreme spectrum. Uh, and it's a really interesting way yeah. to think about and parse things because, you know, a young person might think it's good to have a sports car. Well, why? <laughs> Does that help your character uh, develop? It might. Um, maybe if you have a car or a snow car, uh, you could get to work more reliably. You could serve your cosmopolis more reliably. You could help to support your family more reliably. So in that way, maybe a car is a preferred indifferent um, or, you know, the other way, if you had a car, maybe you suddenly feel like you can go wherever you want and you spend time at the mall and you go to parties and you're not using that car to uh, execute virtuous behavior. And so then that car becomes a dispreferred and different. There are tons of examples, but it's something we're thinking about. Yeah, that's one thing for teens is that, OK, maybe at a younger age you had allowance or your parents would get you something once in a while, but maybe in later teens or mid teens, you'll have your first opportunity to maybe make money at a traditional job, or you're making money in some other way. So how ought people think about money? Some people think, oh, well, I'll have more things. I'll have these designer clothes. People will like me more. Money is an indifferent. We use it as if we have good characters, we should be approaching money in two ways. Uh, first, recognizing that it has no impact on our ability to build a virtuous character. It cannot make us good. It cannot make us bad. What we can do with it, though, could help us uh, or could allow us to do things that or give us opportunities to express a more virtuous character or express a more vicious one. So when we approach money uh, or fancy clothes or whatever it is, we should say, well, how will this fancy suit help me build uh, a more virtuous character? And the answer is the suit won't. However, with a fancy suit, you may be able to get that job that is at that nonprofit agency uh, that is trying to end slavery within the uh, cocoa farming community. And that would be pretty good. You know, that'd be something moving towards virtue. And so maybe in that way, you can, you can pursue saving money or making money to get the good suit, to get the good job, to do the good work. And all, all those goods are in the non-stoic sense. But, um, and so in that way, your suit and the pursuit of money could be a preferred uh, indifferent, and that's okay. Uh, wealth is not a negative or a positive inside of within the bounds of uh, Stoic philosophy. It's it's all in whether or not it will corrupt you, frankly, or or if it will aid you. Yeah, and I find it a tragedy that many adults will live what they call paycheck to paycheck, or always be broke, even though they're making a decent amount of money in their job, but they're spending money on maybe frivolous things. They're going out to eat all the time. They're buying all these expensive clothes electronics, they're going and spending lots of money on alcohol, for instance, cigarettes, whatever might be the case. And maybe they're happy in that moment, but then they're stressed out a lot in the future. So it's one thing stoicism calls for us to think ahead and make good decisions rather than just quote unquote living in the moment or having this attitude of YOLO or, oh, you only live once, so you might as well do this you only live once, you might as well develop your character. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> yes, we, ha we have this uh, short opportunity for life, then why don't we try to make the most of it rather than just uh, squandering our time? And that is one of the more difficult... Stoicism is a difficult philosophy to adhere to, or let's say lifestyle to adhere to, although I, I don't really like that term. But it, it is, it's difficult because 
especially as a young person, I mean, if you're a teenager and, and you're like, okay, well, here's this guy, Tanner, telling me that I shouldn't care about being popular. <laughs> that sounds like a loser to me, <laughs> right? Like that could, uh, that could absolutely be how someone feels right now. Uh, and it can be really hard to say, oh, well, I don't, okay, it's easy for Tanner to say he's already been through high school. He's already been through being a teenager. Um, he doesn't understand how important it is uh, to have friends or to be cool or, you know, whatever it is, or to have a fancy car or to not bring a bag lunch to school because your family can't afford for you to buy expensive lunch at high school. It's hard because the, our default position as human beings, unfortunately, is not to prioritize our character. It, it's to, it is to care what other people think about us. It is to care about the possessions we do have or don't have or how life could be better. And it requires us to constantly, even now, I mean, I'm a 39 year old man. I have to do it all the time. Remind myself about, you know, well, what's the point here? Am, am I supposed to, I love ice cream. Who doesn't like ice cream? But I have to ask myself at the end of every dinner, yeah, is it particularly <laughs> of good, a good reflection of my character that I have a pint of ice cream every night? I would love to, but I probably shouldn't. Uh, and so I don't, but, the, but those decisions you have to, you make them all the time and it can be, it can be overwhelming and it can be exhausting to always do the thing that is in alignment with the desire to build a virtuous character. That's real hard. Uh, and Stoics knew this. Uh, this this is where the term prokoptan comes from. You're not someone who gets it right all the time. You're not someone who's being who's perfect. That's the sage. There have been I don't know maybe three in the entire history of time, according to some people say it was Diogenes. Some people say uh, it was um, the Cato the Younger, right? And some people will say I think also uh, Aristotle or the, the, some of the real real old. Uh, uh, philosophers, Socrates, right? There was no one in 1980 who was like, "Oh, that guy, Steve's a sage." Like it's it's super rare, and it may be that it hasn't ever really happened. Uh, but but they still hold the ideal in their mind because it's something you work towards. And the word prokopton just means uh, it's Greek for some someone who is making progress, and that's not necessarily a uniquely Stoic word. A prokopton could also be a prokopton mechanic, right? You could be working towards becoming a better mechanic, but most people, 99.9999999% of Stoics are, they're not sages, they're prokoptons, they're people who are just making progress. So it's okay that you screw up. I screw up probably a hundred times a day, a thousand times a year, I probably screw up. And that's okay because I'm not a sage. And going back to what you said, something you said earlier, Justin, it's important to give yourself the space to make mistakes and not beat yourself up because the purpose is not to the point is not to become a sage. The point is to become better at whatever speed you can become better. Uh, and if that's just, you know, one mile an hour versus five miles an hour of betterness every day, whatever it is, then that's fine. Uh, and sometimes it's not linear. Sometimes you slip. Sometimes you think it's reflective of a virtuous character to quit smoking or, uh, you know, whatever you smoke, if you smoke anything. And 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 then you have a slip up, and one weekend you decide to have a cigarette, or you decide to smoke a joint, or whatever it is that that, that you're trying to not do. It's not okay, but it's not the end of the world because you can still make progress. Just because your character didn't develop at all today, and maybe you had a backslide, doesn't mean it's over. It's like if you're trying to lose weight, uh, and then Thanksgiving comes and you put back on ten pounds. Well, that's not the end of the game. You're not dead. <laughs> like you can still lose those 10 pounds again. You can still continue to make progress. And you, you can't look at every failure as like as the end of the world. It's not. You've still got plenty of time. But also, memento mori, don't forget, you don't have all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it's asking this question, what must be traded for what? That, okay, well, if it's the idea that I want to be the cool kid or popular, well, if I'm going to treat people poorly in that process, if I'm not going to do the schoolwork, if I'm going to show up late for class, like, is that something we want to aspire to? Uh, probably not. And maybe reframing what it means to be popular as well. Maybe, okay, well, you're not going to win the approval of everyone or this particular group of people, but maybe we can be popular within our own group of friends, the people that we do respect, the honest people, the trustworthy people, the kind people. Yeah, it'd be nice if there were more nice people in the world. It's, it's, it's usually, it's usually true that if the cool person is doing something that, and we all seem to, for whatever reason, you know, you can put your own theories behind why this is, but we all seem to know when someone's not being nice and we feel it in our gut. 
and some of us are, you know, strong enough, I guess, maybe strong is not a great word, but some of us sacrifice the cool points to stand up and say, that's not really great that you're doing that. That's really mean. Even if that might mean that the person who's being mean to that other person now is mean to us and maybe hurts us in some way. Uh, most people will just not say anything. They'll kind of stand on the side as bystanders and be like, well, I'm not going to get involved. I don't think it's right, but I'm not going to get involved. And then some people join in and uh, are harmful to others because it's going to get them more, you know, more cool points or more likes on social or whatever it is that, that kids get now on social. I don't know. From I don't even think we had likes when I had the internet. We had MySpace. We didn't have any of that stuff. We all know when it's wrong. And listening to that internal voice and training it to be the loudest voice we hear and the primary concern, uh, I think is helpful. I think we should all strive to to listen to that little voice of um, our conscience. Do you have any particular advice that you would give to your past self if you could time travel or maybe certain things that you would change? Yeah, this is hard. I mean, I said earlier that I would have liked to have figured out that virtue was the most important thing at a much younger age because it would have changed a lot about me. For, so so now I'm a, I'm a philosopher in stoicism. I, I write. Uh, I have a popular podcast about stoicism, and my life is great. Um, but, you know, I dropped out of high school, went to military academy, got a GED, dropped out of college because I couldn't afford it, had a whole bunch of jobs, most of which I didn't like spent a lot of time unhappy and miserable and worried about what other people thought. And maybe I do wish I could have done that differently, but at the same time, you know, your life is the life that it is and it leads you to the place that it leads you. And everyone listening to this podcast, it has, it has led them to this moment. Uh, and maybe I don't want to change any of that. I don't know if my life would be better or not, but I can't see if I hadn't discovered virtue, which I may have never discovered if, you know, I don't know if my life had been any different. Yeah, I guess I pr I probably wouldn't change it, but it, but if in if we're imagining I have a time machine, I guess, and I can still discover virtue by telling it to myself, maybe I would. Although I don't know if fourteen year old Tanner would have listened to thirty nine year old Tanner. He would have been like, "Who's this old dude? Why'd I get so fat? Is that a beard? That's a pretty cool beard." But that would have been the end of it. <laughs> yeah, maybe some uh, maybe some advice for people struggling in school. Maybe they don't like school, certain teachers, or they're just having a hard time with certain subjects. Sure. Um, if you so, if you're having trouble with a teacher, first of all, realize your role in that classroom. You're a student, and your job is to learn. Now, now there are a couple of kinds of not so great teachers, right? There are ones we don't like because they make us work, <laughs> and they won't tolerate any of our nonsense. And then there are some teachers who are not great teachers. I mean, just like some people are bad at their at any job, that exists in teaching as well. So I think, first of all, to recognize that your job in the classroom is to learn. That's your role. And if you care about stoicism, you care about role ethics. And so your responsibility in that classroom is to learn. You're, it doesn't matter whether or not the teacher is competent, if, if that's the kind of bad teacher that you're thinking of, or if the teacher just doesn't seem to like you and that bothers you, or you think the teacher is lame. None of that really matters because those things are not a direct impact of your ability to learn. Now, in the, in the most prior sense, if the teacher is incompetent, I would ask yourself whether or not you're in a position to assess that. You are, after all, a student in their classroom and not the other way around. Uh, and if you, know, if you truly felt that they were, the, the way to deal with that probably isn't to act out against the, the teacher, but is rather to go to a guidance counselor, express some concerns and say, you know, I take learning in this class fairly seriously. I don't feel like I'm learning well under this teacher. Is it possible to put me in a different math class, for example? And I will tell you right now <laughs> that, that if I were a guidance counselor and a student came to me and said, I take my role as a student very seriously. I'm having a hard time in this class. The instructor and I don't seem to mesh well and they don't communicate in the way that I need them to communicate to learn. Is there another teacher that I could learn math under? They might be pretty open to that because they'd be like, oh my gosh, a kid in high school who cares about learning math, that's amazing. Um, but, but if it's any of those other two things, you, your job isn't to like your teacher and your teacher's job isn't to like you. Their role is to teach you. Your role is to learn. And you need to put all that other stuff out of your head because it's just going to take away from you fulfilling your role as a student. And if you care about developing a virtuous character, you got to care about feeling, fulfilling your roles. And in that case, your students. So to learn. 
And I wonder if you're struggling with a certain topic, asking for help, whether the teacher would be open to that. Uh, as a teacher, you know, maybe it could be a different thing if someone asks for help after class or say, oh, well, I have a study hall coming up. I have some extra time here. So maybe we could review some problems or some questions that were on the test so I can better understand it. I would think the teacher would be quite open to that in many situations. We would absolutely hope so. Yeah, I think uh, group study sessions after school, there's probably an extracurricular of some kind that has to do with that, with tutoring. The school may or may not offer tutoring, whether or not the teacher does. And there are usually uh, sources external to school for tutoring. I mean, there are tutoring centers. When I was a kid, I think there was like the Sylvan Learning Center that probably doesn't exist anymore. There are ways to learn and and, and that, and those ways to learn may also be, and this goes back to building friendships in high school or middle school, whatever it is, um, it, you might have a friend who could tutor you. And if the kind of friends that you've been, if the kind of friendships you've been building have been friendships with people who take their education seriously and take their responsibilities and roles seriously, well, all of a sudden that nerdy kid in the back that the cool kids are throwing paper at or making fun of, you've made friends with them and, and maybe they're really grateful for your friendship and maybe you can ask them for help and they can tutor you too. There, there are lots of options. Uh, asking the teacher, going to your guidance counselor, asking a friend who feels they can help you. And you know, if you have a friend that is only worried about being cool, they'll probably laugh at you for asking for help. You don't want those kinds of friends. All right, very good. I'll give you an opportunity to share your content. But before that, do you have anything else to add to the conversation? No, I would just say thank you to you, Justin, for allowing me to come on the show. It's really cool to me that that you that the audience that you have is interested in learning about this stuff, especially at a young age. Um, I think that's great. I think one of the biggest challenges facing, uh, I can speak for America because that's where I live, uh, is a lack of interest in virtue and character development, uh, and more of a more of a focus on. I have a right to this, or this is the way you should treat me, or I deserve this. And those things are important. Rights are important, but they are at least equally important as being taught that, you know, a, a lot of what makes us good, the only thing that makes us good, is the quality of our character. And, and that is probably slightly more important than anything else. And it's at least equally important. And it's great that you're talking, you're, you're allowing me to talk about it on your show. Uh, to your audience. Uh, if, if anybody is interested in listening to my show, it's called Practical Stoicism. You can find it at stoicismpod.com. It's anywhere you listen to podcasts, probably where you listen to Justin's. Uh, so you can just search for Practical Stoicism. And we have a Discord community. It's got about 600 people in it. Um, you can find that at stoicismpod.com forward slash Discord, free to join. And so I've got a book coming out called Stoicism But Brief for people who would like an in-depth primer. You can learn more about that on the stoicismpod.com website. And that's really it, Justin. I, I really appreciate you having me on the show, giving me a chance to speak to your audience. Uh, you've been a great host, and I'm grateful. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming on. And to spell that out for listeners, that's S-T-O-I-C-I-S-M pod, P-O-D dot com. All right. And from there, any social media, any other ways that people can connect with you? I am on Instagram at Tanner Thinks. I'm on Twitter at Stoicism Tanner, and I'm probably on TikTok at Stoicism Pod, and we're on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash at no sages, uh, and we create mini documentaries every month. If you want to check those out, we just did one on the Stoic Sage, uh, and we've done one on the history of uh, Stoicism and its founder, uh, Zeno of Fitium. All right. Very good. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more content. See the show notes for more information and links surrounding topics discussed in this episode. Support my efforts through my Patreon page found at stoicsolutionspodcast.com. Access special perks, including having upcoming podcast guests answer your questions, custom-made podcast episodes, and private one-on-one -on -one calls to discuss whatever you'd like. Visit my other podcast at hurdygurdytravel.com, that's H-U-R-D-Y-G-U-R-D-Y, travel.com, to learn how to make money, save money, and travel the world at low cost with credit card rewards, deals, and loyalty programs. Find me in the 2022 book Stoicism Today, Selected Writings, Volume 4. Order a paperback or a Kindle version of the book from Amazon.com. Thanks to generous patrons and fans of this podcast who help support my work. Have a great day.